It is my great pleasure to introduce Antonia Lawrence Allen, and who is Edinburgh and East of Scotland curator for the National Trust for Scotland, and has become a friend over the time that we have uh, worked together for the exhibition, for events at Kelly Castle, um, a friend to the Lorimer Society. Antonia is an art historian, and I think that brings with it uh, a very positive influence, uh, a love and enthusiasm and commitment to, and desire to find out through researching and talking to people and imagining uh, the connections that there might be. And so she's been a very positive influence in our development of this exhibition. Antonia is also a chapter author in the book of the exhibition, uh, which carries the same name, Reflections, the Light and Life of John Henry Lorimer. So as the secretary for the Lorimer Society, it's uh, a delight to be able to say thank you for your help in facilitating the National Trust for Scotland contribution to the exhibition and just your personal way of being, Antonia. I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing you again tonight. It is again for me, but it's on, uh, you know, it's a different talk. So over <laughs> to you and everybody, please do keep mute, but please leave the, use the chat facility and Margaret will be picking up on your questions, uh, which will come to uh, the end of Antonia's talk. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owen and Wendy. That's such a lovely introduction. And, and thank you for considering me a friend. I, I take that to heart and I much appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to move on to the first slide here. Um, and I want to sort of um, start by just saying this is this is a little bit of fun. I mean, it's been a lot of fun for me. But um, what I what I want to do today is to take you on a tour through Kelly um, through the photographs that we have of the property, but also through John Henry's paintings. So Kelly was really significant to John Henry's career, um, sig significant enough um, that even the Parisian, Parisians knew that uh, the quality of the property for his work and the importance um, of the property. And there's a brilliant quote um, that an art critic um, wrote down in a, in a review in 1889 and mentions Kelly as the source of John Henry's ability to capture light. So the critic said, and I'm gonna paraphrase, I should be inclined to say that Mr. Lorimer belongs to the first class of painters and that his art was undoubtedly influenced by his surroundings. Born in romantic Edinburgh, and living for many years in an exquisitely tasteful and delightfully empty old Scotch castle, Lorimer's eye seems to have acquired from childhood the sentiment of artistic proportion and harmonious colouring, which has given him the ability to capture light. So we won't go into the kind of um, the empty old Scotch castle and the romantic Edinburgh, because I'm sure somebody would, um, some of you might uh, have con contentions with that. But the reason it's important is that I think it was an open secret um, that Kelly was really, really important to his work. So just briefly, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. Um, I, I am an art historian and I love talking about paintings, but I'm not going to go into the painterly style of John Henry tonight, which I think sits between realism and impressionism um, in the sort of spectrum of art history. Really, in in a basic uh, basic way, he he had two very sort of significant forms um, in his work: landscapes and genre paintings, a lot of them based at Kelly, and portraits. And portraits was how he earned his money, where um, he got a lot of his work. Um, but the genre scenes were where he he earned a lot of um, critical acclaim, and it was the area that he particularly enjoyed um enjoyed painting so he had a life in paris he had a life in london and in edinburgh i'm not really going to talk about any of that today i'm just literally going to talk about kelly so if none of you have been to kelly i urge you to go it is um, a very unique space um it has an aura about it that is um is intangible you can't really describe it and that's what john henry brings out in his paintings um, 
I want to demonstrate here, firstly, how captivating it was for him to live and work at the property, but just to show you how his paintings were both artistic creations and imaginations, as well as a little bit of documentary of what was going on at the time when he was when he was living there. And some of these have intriguingly sort of helped me as the curator piece some evidence together of what was going on when the Lorimers were restoring the castle. So I've always believed that it's this painting of all the paintings that he completed um, that really encapsulates John's Henry, John Henry's attitude towards Kelly. He titled it, as you can see, Any Port in a Storm. And I think it joyfully captures this flock of birds gathered in the entrance to the castle. This is the Southwest Tower. Um, and it's a tower that was added and extended in the late 1500s and early 1600s to make the property more spacious and comfortable for entertaining guests, which again, I think is really apropos because this is where we welcome visitors today into the property. And this painting tells us about the house. It tells us that it's a shelter, a respite and a retreat from the blustery world outside. So you can see the 18th century paneling and the flagstone floors, which suggest a history. And then there's the green door, the practical doormat, the mirrors and the antique rug, which suggests a home. This is a faithful representation of the hall. And this recent photograph shows you the 17th and 18th century elements that are still in place. The furniture and the paintings have changed since the National Trust of Scotland took ownership of the property in the late 1970s. And John Henry did several paintings of this space. We know, for example, of two watercolours, a medium that he, he used a lot. He was a member of the watercolour, the Royal Society of Watercolourists. Um, and he used it predominantly when he was living at Kelly um, and towards the later part of his life. But here's one looking up the stairs, which you can see is, is absolutely accurate. Now have a look, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but have a look at um, the items in the painting. So you've got the clock uh, and the mirror, uh, the mirrors on both walls. Um, and then you've got the ship hanging from the ceiling. This is a view on the left hand side here of, of looking down and you can there see the mirrors and you can see the ship hanging from the ceiling. Um, this is a recent photograph of the same view um, and you can see we ha don't have any of the elements particularly in place um, but you can see we've got any port in the storm right there in the hallway. Now we do have some of this furniture, um, the barometer for example right here it's a close-up and you can see it hanging on the wall of his painting that's by the front door so that's still in place the ship we have currently in store um, waiting for a good clean and we're going to put it back up again the mirror that you can see in in the watercolor on the right um, is actually in the drawing room and we have several stools designed by robert lorimer his brother john henry's brother um, and that are very similar to the one in the painting so what I want to do is just quickly stop here for a moment and review why John Henry is painting at Kelly. Now, many of you might know this, but it just requires just a little bit of context. So the family acquired the lease of Kelly in 1878 and immediately started restoring the property, including large portions of the roof, which had failed, and the chimneys that were choked with birds' nests. The youngest child, Louise, um, actually, sorry, she wasn't the, she the youngest girl, noted that they were literally taking back the house from the rooks and the owls. And this is something that their father, Professor James Lorimer, pictured here, immortalized in a plaque above the front door, um, which is quite nice that he's captured her um, impressions of the first um, time that they saw the property. And John Henry's paintings are filled with this sort of nostalgia and sentimentality of being in the property with family at the beginning of these years when they were taking back the house from the owls and the rooks. Um, but they're also filled with these documentary details, as I suggested. So just comparing these two doors here, John Henry painted this in 1893, the Anyport in the Storm. And that's about 10 years after this photograph was taken of his father. And what John Henry's got in his painting is just the practicalities of living in a house. There's a door knocker 
and then there's a, some wooden baseboards, you know, where you might kick the door or where the door might rot from the wet. And they're just practical things, likely additions that they would have had in a busy entrance to a fam family home. So as I said, the property was barely habitable when the family first took residence in September 1878. That's when they had their first overnight. The only places that the family could live in during these years, uh, sorry, these first months rather, were the dining room, which you can see here, um, and the southeast tower, which is um, the, where the library is and the rooms above. Professor James and his wife slept in the library and the girls in the room above and the boys above that. Um, and there was this like there's a nice little note in one of the um, letters from uh, one of the girls saying that the her father was trying to chivy the children and get them all excited about being in this place by suggesting that it was like living on a ship on the ocean. And they said, yeah, it might be like that, but it's just as bad as that as well. So I'm not sure that they were that impressed with the conditions that they had when they first moved in. So what we're going to do is we're going to go on a trip uh, through Kelly um, and we're going to go through the front doors and up the landing. Um, and we're going to get to the top landing here. Um, and what you can see in front of you are the turret stairs that take you up to the bedrooms above. Now, this is John Henry's 1884 painting, and it's fairly accurate for the details that it's recording. It's documenting the red painted stairwell which incidentally, there's a, a story which I'm not entirely sure is true, but the paint reputedly was left over from the fourth road bridge, uh, so rail bridge, sorry, um, that, that had extra paint one year. So I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, he's recorded the lovely thick cornicing um, and the wood paneling, which was a soft gray um, uh, that they painted all the paneling and inserted a lot of paneling um, in those first years. And the brighter creamy white um, is an addition by Hugh and Mary, who moved into the property, Hugh and Mary Lorimer, um, later on in the 18, 1940s, 1948. So you can still see here the shelf, which is set into the corner uh, on the right hand side there, the thick floorboards and the flagstone floor. Um, and there's just little nice details. So the Lorimers moved their red curtain to the right, we move it to the left. They have a small rug on the floor, which is a little bit impractical for us because we have so many visitors and it's a trip hazard. Um, the other thing, if you note on the far left of the painting, John Henry has added a panel painting here, which to my knowledge has not ever existed in this space. Um, the panel paintings were only in the dining room. He's also obviously created a narrative, um, which we think is entirely fictional um, and is part of his kind of um, his technique of his genre scenes. Um, he uses, as we will see more and more, um, his family as models. And this is his sister, Louise, who is sobbing after saying goodbye to someone. Now, Louise, we know, features in quite a few of his paintings. So, this one, we think, is the first painting that was set at Kelly, done in 1879, finished in 1880. We know it was done in 1879 because Hannah, Louise and John Henry's sister, wrote a letter in 1879 describing it. She said it was a little pet of a picture and it featured Louise weeping at Johnny's bedroom window at Kelly and Tone the dog licking and trying to comfort her while mother waves her handkerchief out of Jim's bedroom. Now, Jim was the eldest of the siblings and was known to the family as the merchant because he began an apprenticeship with a Leith merchant when he was 18. He left the family for good in 1883, traveling to Liverpool, uh, from Liverpool rather to Australia, living in Tasmania before moving to South Africa, where he sadly died in 1896 in his early 40s. This painting, um, Farewell, in 1879-1880, is really too early to depict the sadness of losing Jim, unless he was just going, um, going away for, um, had come for the weekend and was going, going back to Edinburgh. It might be that the farewell that they're saying, uh, that they're noting here, John Henry's noting here, was for his sister. Um, this is Janet Alice. She married um, the previous year, in 1878, and she left to go to live in British, what was known then as British Guyana, um, with her husband. Um, and she came back with her children, as we'll see as we go through. So it could be marking her farewell. 
But whatever the context of the picture, the letter, Hannah's letter, and the image unequivocally tells us that John and Jim had bedrooms in Kelly. So Louise is crying at John's window, which is definitely in the southwest tower. It's likely on the second floor. This tells us really that in 1879, which is just a year later, that the that southwest tower is now habitable. They're now using it for bedrooms, which is something that we we weren't sure of kind of how fast the restorations are going. But this is some definitive proof that they were using this tower. And Jim's bedroom was in the southeast tower, which looks like it could be the current library on the second floor, could have been the one above maybe. Um, and until we linked the letter to the painting, Jim's presence at Kelly had never been discussed. We didn't know he had a bedroom. So it's just really lovely to know and to be able to lo locate where that bedroom um, might have been. Farewell also provides us with one of the only documented images of the garden before these stables that you can see out the window here were added by the Lorimers in the 1880s. So before that, the garden uh, walls were in a terrible state um, when they moved in. And you can see in the painting that the garden walls um, um, are there. And then um, in 1880s, they're covered over by the stables. Um, so it's quite interesting. The stables are now used. Uh, you can see the stables when you come as a visitor. Uh, and they were used from um, the 1950s onwards by Hugh Lorimer as a sculpture studio. So that's how you um, how it's set up today. So other paintings set in this southwest tower, the same one as the farewell, um, include the flight of the swallows. This was completed several decades later in 1906. And in this painting, the family is looking out over the south facade of the building. This painting is probably a view from the third floor, so just the room above where Louise was crying. Um, it's known as the Blue Room because of the colour scheme that was added in the 50s by Hugh's wife, Mary, which, as she was making a bedroom for her daughter, Monica. But John Henry has made an artistic adjustment. I don't know if you've spotted it yet, but he has increased the height of the window. So each sash has nine astragals rather than six. Now, there are windows like that in the property, but they're down in the main um, drawing room um, area, so not in this area of the of the castle. A closer look at the painting reveals the room behind us reflected in the mirrors, providing evidence that the Lorimers used similar roller blinds that we use today, which is a cool little fact. And in the left mirror, Lorimer has painted the corner door open with a suggestion of a stairwell, something that is rumoured to be there but remains bricked up today. The mirrors feature in several paintings, including this wonderful 1913 painting, Sunlight in a Scottish Room. It has what Duncan Macmillan has called a beautiful simplicity, which he thinks is best found in the interiors that John Henry doesn't include figures, and I, I think I might slightly agree with him. Um, this is the room that you step into from the entrance hall. It's the great apartment that was added in the late 1500s and the early 1600s. The drawing room today can be experienced in much the same luminous light that John Henry captures. So when photographer uh, Nick Haynes came to Kelly last autumn to take photographs for the Lorimer Society exhibition and the Reflections um, publication, we looked around Kelly for those spaces and those places that John Henry had captured on canvas. We waited until the sun was in the west late in the day and Nick captured this image. John Henry's painting was completed in the summer when a stronger daylight filters through the glass for a much longer period of time. And I always like to think of this painting as an ode to the sun filled days that they spent during the summer at Kelly. We do still have some of the furniture featured in this painting too. These two chairs are similar in style to the chair in the painting, and they're both designed by Robert Lorimer, uh, John Henry's brother. And this elegant 18th century French sofa was collected by Robert. When this picture was painted in 1913, John Henry and his brother were helping their mother maintain the house. Um, and so a lot of Robert's furniture was still in the house. She died just three years later in 1916, the same year that Robert bought Gibbleston, which is the house that he renovated and restored down the road um, from Kelly. And so he took um, a large portion of his, his furniture out. 
Um, and then when Robert died, um, his son Hugh inherited some of the furniture and it came back to Kelly. The next room in the grand apartment scheme is the dining room. John Henry set several paintings in here, including this really sketchy watercolour, which focuses on the northeast corner of the room, looking into the southeast tower, that original space where they lived in, the eight, in 1878. Some things of note, which I found quite interesting to spot, John Henry has a door, has painted a door here in the corner, where in reality there are painted panels. If you look above the door in the painting and in the photograph, you can see he's omitted the panel painting here too. Then look behind the dog that is sniffing at something under the red curtain. John Henry has painted the stairs, so they swing down to stop on the landing to the right of the door. Yet in reality, if you look at the photograph, you can see that the stairs actually stop before the landing, straight ahead of the door. So in reality, you can actually turn right here and enter the library. The other thing he adds in the painting is a door behind the girl coming up the stairs. There isn't a door there at all. There is a door, however, off to the left that you can't see if you go out that door to the stairs and turn left. What you what you find there is a kitchen um, that was added. It wasn't there in 1878, but it was added in the 1950s by Hugh and Mary Lorimer. The circle I've added here shows where the entry is to that. What we don't really know is what was there before um, and what, we, what we've got is sort of a little bit of evidence of what they were fixing up at the time. So if you look at this photograph, above the stools there's a recess um, and that's where a hatch was added um, in the 1950s. Now what John Henry um, did when he was there in, in the 70s and the early 80s was help to replace some of the panels here that had been destroyed because of damp. And so these two, this is where the hatch is now, but there wasn't a hatch there before. You can see in his painting that there's a ledge there and there's a sort of te a textile of some kind hanging down. So what was there, we don't really know. But we do know is some of those panel paintings were damaged beyond repair. And so he's replaced some of them and these two on the hatch doors are by John Henry. Um, and we, so it's kind of intriguing to just sort of wonder what was there in 18 in the 1870s. I'm a bit sort of reticent about believing John Henry's um, paintings as, as documentary evidence because they're clearly not. He's making a lot of things and imagining a lot of things. Um, I think Kelly's interiors, um, he uses them like kind of a book of designs. He sort of picks and chooses um, what he needs to achieve something that pleases his compositional eye. He's not really interested in veracity, I don't think. Um, in this painting, uh, potpourri, um, we're still in the dining room and we've, we've gone along the wall, we're facing northwest now, um, but the door looks really odd as it opens um, directly onto a stairwell, which in reality is, is some distance to the left. There's no way it's impossible to see that stairwell from, from the dining room. Um, and the children are walking through a door that looks like it's at like a 90 degree angle. It doesn't look flat against the wall and it's a very odd um, construction. Um, and as well as playing with the interior, potpourri is actually a fictive family scene. Um, the suggestion here is that this is John Henry's mother seated with her daughters, Janet, Alice, who's kneeling, and either Hannah or Louise standing with a tray of rose petals tucked under her arm. And the children are five of Janet's six children. The youngest at the time was the baby, James, um, who would have been one in 1889. And there you can see him um, sitting on the floor with a basket on his head, having tipped all the potpourri everywhere. So the figure of Janet does actually resemble her portrait, which was completed a year later. Um, and a portrait that does include, I think, her son James, who would have been two. Yet John Henry's diary records that potpourri was completed over several years using numerous models. So in the summer of 1886, he starts the picture and he takes it to London uh, the following year. And he gets a young girl called Maud Bannister to model for the painting and a lady called Miss Heyman to stand in, quote, stand in for one of the ladies. When he returns to Kelly, he then asks a Miss Thompson to step in as a model. And the painting is finally finished in 1889, the summer that Janet Alice 
comes to Kelly with her children. But this all gives us a bit of an insight into how John Henry paints, what his method is. So he uses his sister's faces, perhaps the poses, he's inspired by their visits and when they're available at Kelly. Um, and then he has friends and local women um, and interestingly women in London when he takes it down to his studio in London to mimic their poses as he adjusts and he builds the composition, adding bits here and there. But I do think that Potpourri does capture Kelly in its heyday as the Lorimer's summer home, surrounded by all this, um, this artistic and historic panelling and plaster work um, that inspired their own creativity and making. Another painting set in the dining room that shows how John Henry composed scenes of domesticity by augmenting family members and mixing these fixtures and fittings is this one, Grandma's Birthday. Um, here, we're privy to the Lorimers at prayer before birthday tea. The matriarch, you can see her sitting just behind the candles there with her head bowed at the head of the table, surrounded by her 12 grandchildren. Apparently, the picture was inspired by the christening party held at Kelly for Hannah's fifth child that I just mentioned, James, who can be seen swaddled in the arms of a nursemaid here. Several things of note um, that are interesting. James was born five years before this was completed. Um, this sort of reminds us of how long John Henry's process was, if this indeed was inspired by his christening. Second, Mrs. Lorimer did not have 12 grandchildren. She actually ended up with 10. Uh, and the youngest was Michael Lorimer, Robert's youngest boy, who was born in 1912, so quite some time after this was completed. And third, the nursemaid holding the baby um, was um, a reality. She, did, she was indeed employed by Janet to look after her six children. Her name was Johanna Herbert, and she was a Guyanese woman that the Chalmers family had met and employed in 1881, where Janet's husband, David, was working as a chief justice. She stayed with the family for over 30 years, but John Henry doesn't capture her really with any fidelity or consistency. So here are some details from two other paintings featuring Joanna, one from four years earlier and the other completed seven years before grandmother's birthday. Joanna looks decades younger in both and actually she looks like a completely different person in both. So maybe he had models standing in for her, I'm not entirely sure. The Mushroom Gatherers um, was actually drafted um, two years before it was completed, so it was drafted in 1884 um, and Janet and her family were visiting. And we know that uh, Joanna modelled for John Henry because there's letters um, and notes saying that um, she was she resisted wearing the headscarf. She didn't want to wear the headscarf. Um, and Charlotte Lorimer writes about this in the chapter to her book, uh, the book, the Reflections book. Um, and it's it's really intriguing because the headscarf was a symbol of enslavement. Um, Joanna's mother was a slave, um, she was enslaved. Um, she was then freed um, after uh, Joanna was was born. Um, but she was um, the product of a of a rape um, by a white man in power. Um, and so she she didn't want to wear the headscarf as it reminded her of of that um, of that her past and so she wouldn't have worn it by choice. So it's quite interesting to, to see how he's um, created a fiction, an imaginary um, kind of idea of the quote unquote nursemaid, even though Joanna Herbert was really a part of the family and loved by the children um, and stayed with them for years. So John Henry was creating imaginative scenes and it seems that his family was really aware of this and found it really fun and amusing. Um, John Henry's younger sister Louise had written to her eldest sister in 1893 about this particular painting, saying that they were having great fun with all the little local children who were coming, posing for the picture, and they were having lots of little lunches and it was all good fun at Kelly. Um, the critics, however, found this quite odd. They found the sort of fiction and reality really difficult to grasp, not all of them, but some of them. And um, Hannah Lorimer, the, the mother of John Henry, defended her son against some of the um, reviews that he got, just um, saying, what's so wrong with, with, with mixing fiction and reality? It's simply a birthday party with a gathering of children from different families. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with it. And there isn't anything wrong with it. But what's curious, I think, 
is um, the kind of fiction and reality that he he does blend at Kelly. Um, so he intricately copies things to the nth degree, and then he makes this sort of sentimental fictional uh, story. So if you look, um, it's not a very good photograph, I apologize. But if you look at the photograph of the dining room um, and you look at the panels and look particularly the one above the mirror, you can see how accurately he's he's painted these in in the picture. Um, but he's also added things and changed things around. So he's added shutters. Um, there were never shutters in this room because of the paneled paneled pa uh, the painted panels. Um, they would have obscured them and there wasn't any room for them. And this painting is really interesting because he's strikingly added a highly decorative ceiling that isn't found in this room. So in this room, in the dining room, um, there is plaster work um, with a crest that marks the marriage of Alexander Erskine, the third Earl of Kelly, to his first wife, Lady Mary Kilpatrick. Um, and John Henry um, must maybe found this too plain, I don't know, and added instead a composite of two other ceilings that are found in the bedrooms in the floor above. So the most obvious is the most elaborately plastered room in the property. It's known as the Vine Room, which very similar to the plaster work completed for Charles II at Holyrood in Edinburgh in the early 1670s. This room was actually well known to all the siblings because when they arrived in 1878, the north side was um, badly affected by damp, um, had been damaged. Um, the north side, which you can see here, where the bed is against, um, had to be uh, repaired completely. Um, and the wreath around the painting also had to be repaired. Um, and the, the actual panel painting wasn't there at the time. Um, it didn't come back to Kelly until 1916. It had been taken to Ireland in, the 18, in 1830 um, just by the 11th Earl's wife who decided she wanted to have it in Ireland rather than having it at Kelly. Um, so anyway, they took down the plaster work um, and they reapplied it, they copied it and reapplied it. And they were doing this as John Henry and his siblings were coming to Kelly and working alongside or with or being inspired by the plasterers from uh, Pitt and Weem. So that's one inspiration for the ceiling for this painting. The other source that Jen, John Henry used for this birthday party is a Cupid, which you can just see in the painting here in the top left. And it is in from the second largest bedroom in the property, which is next to the vine room. It's known as the Earl's Room and the plasterwork was added by the third Earl of Kelly again in his renovations, same renovations sort of in the, um, of the vine room. Um, and it marks his second marriage to Mary D.L. in 1676. The motive of the Cupid is quite interesting, actually, because it, it, um, it's found at Balkaski Estate, which is just down the road from, from Kelly. And it's where Charles II's architect, William Bruce, was building his house in the 1660s. So that's where the, the kind of link is with Holyrood and the same plaster work appearing in Holyrood as it appears in Kelly is because the architect is living down the road doing his own house. So there's that kind of linkage there with um, architects and workers, which is really fascinating. The other source, um, John Henry uh, used, um, no, sorry, actually, I was going to mention that the crests of the third Earl that we saw in the Earl's room um, and the second wife can also be seen in this room, which is the drawing room um, where we first entered from the hallway where, we, where you saw that beautiful picture um, of sunlight in a Scottish room. Um, you can see here that there's no Cupid in this room, but in this painting, he adds that Cupid and that attic angled panelled um, um, ceiling from the Earl's room. So this spring moonlight painting is set in the drawing room, but he's he's added and um, it augmented so much of it. He's added a second window, which is obvious. So you can see that he's widened the room. Um, but the other perhaps more subtle thing is if you look at the floorboards, you can see that he's changed the floorboards um, from going towards the window um, to going parallel to the window, which helps increase in his painting the effectiveness of linear perspective, making the picture deeper, giving it more depth. He also adds a panel painting above the door at the back there, which is not there in reality. Now this Cupid gets about, flies about the place all over the place. And here the Cupid features in another painting called the birthday party. 
um, that John Henry started in 1897 um, and took him over to, well, what was that, 20 years to complete. Um, so while the painting does accurately depict the door into the stairwell of the Southwest Tower from the Earl's room, this is a picture of it, it um, omits the wall that separates the bedroom from its dressing room. The door that you see in the photo leads into the dressing room, which does have this west facing window. So he's just taken the, taken the wall away. So in that sense, sort of in, putting in the, the light and the laughter and the music um, that accompanied um, his sister's visits with the children and just um, not worrying too much about the architectural um, details. I wanted to show you this uh, 1892 postcard just so you can see the reality of what perhaps it, um, are the, the nephews and nieces. I mean, these could be local children, but I think it's the nephews and nieces um, of uh, John Henry. Um, David was the eldest and he was born in 1880. Um, so he would have been around 12 years old in 1892. His sisters, Hannah and Alison were about 10 and eight and Thomas was about six and James around four. The youngest Esther was born two years after this postcard was published. So this painting captures what could be a two and a four year old, so possibly Thomas and James, but it also captures a couple of features in the exterior of the building, which are still in situ today. So there's the Kelly Bell, which is in this little box here, and the Erskine coat of arms. Professor Lorimer had written a history of Kelly, um, which uh, was called the Red Book of Kelly. And in it, he notes that in 1884, he was given two bells. So these bells aren't original to Kelly, but he was the one who put them there. He was given a large and a small one by the secretary of Edinburgh University, Professor Wilson. The bells had actually hung in the old college of Edinburgh and they were unsuitable for the new extended buildings of 1789. So Professor Lorimer writes, the larger bell now hangs in a small penthouse, which I think is an amazing um, term for this little wooden box. Um, he says, the penthouse hangs between the two dining room windows. The sides of the penthouse are made of stained wood and the roof is covered with five of the old slates of the castle. The bell isn't larger than a good sized dinner bell, but it has a sweet and penetrating tone and is heard at a considerable distance. And here, John Henry paints it just years after it was installed, and we have the bell at Kelly. Now, this is the north side of the castle, so from, from the garden, looking at the back, and we're going to go up to John Henry's studio, which was one of the first new things to be added by the family. John Henry wasn't very well in 1878, and his mother organised this studio space for him at the top of the Northwest Tower to encourage him to come to enjoy the fresh air of the East Nook of Fife, paint, relax, recuperate. The studio was readied for his 23rd birthday in 1879, and in the August, he wrote to his sister saying it's a great success. So you'll notice that the sharp angle of the turret roofs here, this was the least expensive way of making the turret wind and watertight, as both of the conical roofs had collapsed by the 1870s. Um, the Lorimers actually inserted the skylight and a window, you can see in the, um, in the top picture there, the top photograph there, um, and, and it had a pulley to allow the large canvases up and, and down from the outside into the studio. So the studio is a setting for several paintings, including this one of Joanna Herbert that I mentioned before. Um, she's sitting on the step rocking John Henry's nephew. The setting is almost certainly in the studio because there isn't any other room in the house that has that, that little recess that you can see where there's a spinning wheel um, just beside where she sits. Um, and he's bought up some furnishings. So I don't know if this is what he had in his room or if he bought them up specifically to dress the room um, just particularly for this painting. So there's this animal skin rug on the ground, um, a lovely red curtain, lantern and a painting. Many years later, he painted a portrait of his mother in this studio. It was commissioned by his older sister, Hannah, and it seems that Mrs. Lorimer was uncomfortable. While well, she was suffering from the cold that was seeping into her weary joints, which was exacerbated by rheumatism at the time. She wasn't inclined to sit for her portrait in the garden or at the piano, which John Henry had tried. So he decided to take her up to the studio, which I'm not entirely sure why, because it's freezing up there. But in a 1902 letter to his sister, he tells her, we got arranged up in the studio, she with that long white muslin thing she wears, and her silver ornaments, 
Dixon helped to make up a little platform and it was all pretty comfortable, light and good shade. I thought it a fine, definite, simple arrangement sitting in that nice chair that I got in Dundee, which is usually in my writing turret. A sitting, leaning back, hands both resting on the arms of the chair, which shows them well. There's a book on her lap. It's the Morris chapter in the Stones of Venice with white cover and pink ties hanging down. Her chagrin spectacle case and spectacles out on her book. Her head is leaning a little forward. Now, interestingly, Hannah notes when she was sent a photograph of the final painting that her mother's discomfort is really evident in her facial expression. And amusingly, she said, oh, looks like mother has her face on, which I presume is the same face that all mothers make when they are displeased. I know my kids know exactly what my face looks like. So he painted his mother and sisters in a much warmer light in the room two floors down from the studio in this Northwest Tower some years before. The mother sits reading in the background while the sisters embroider and sew. The room really isn't changed much since uh, that time, although the stools have been replaced, um, as has the window. We also have the bed, we have a bed cover. I don't know if it's the bed cover, but it's very similar to the one that's being sewn um, in the painting. This one at Kelly that you can see a detail of here was designed by Robert Lorimer when he was about 24 years old. And we know he did designs for his sister um, and his, his sisters, his mother and his wife. And so we're coming to the end of our tour here with some final interiors. The first one depicts a mother soothing her child to sleep. In reality, this is actually a portrait of Violet and Christopher, Robert's wife and first child. And it really has the tenderness and simplicity that sits incredibly comfortably within this white panelled interior. Now, the setting could be in Kelly's library, the room in the Southeast Tower, first slept in by the professor and then his wife and then by Jim, possibly, uh, and then used by the professor as a study. But perhaps it was used also by family members after 1890 when the professor died. It was turned into a warm drawing room in the 20th century and Hugh Lorimer lived here um, or used this room after the NTS took on the property in the 1970s. The panelling and the floorboards do match those that John Henry includes in the painting and the library does have the same view looking out to the south. So you can see here in the painting through the open window on the horizon is the familiar shape of the Bass Rock just off North Berwick in the east Lothian coast. A view that you can see from this window seat in the library, but you can also see it from the rooms above. So above the library, um, they were all bedrooms um, that the family had used when they first moved in and they continued to use. So this room um, is the ones directly above the library and we don't use it right now because the library ceiling below is very vulnerable. And we don't want to put any weight um, uh, coming down from above. But you can see how the, the panelling is so similar and the view looks out the same way. You can also see a view out from the vine bedroom, again facing south, with that the vine bedroom is the one with the wonderful plaster ceiling that we saw earlier. Um, Hush, though, only has one window, um, so and the vine bedroom has two, but there is a painting, the 11th hour, that has two windows with the same um, panelling, um, which might have been set potentially in the vine room. However, if you look at the 11th hour, um, you can, well, this is just showing you that there's almost exactly the same um, view out the window in both of these paintings um, looking south. And that's the view that you get to see today. It looks pretty much the same as this painting, except for currently we don't have cows. And I think I might advocate for bringing the cows back. Um, but that's, you know, kind of a fun thing. So the other thing about this painting, which I just wanted to mention, is that inside um, the vine room, there is no door on the left hand side here. Um, there are there is a door into a spiral staircase, but um, it sh basically is on the opposite side of the room um, and you walk out of the room onto the top landing of a stairwell, not halfway up, as John Henry has has kind of shown in this painting. Basically, to conclude this, this is a really confusing house. So if you're confused, and you don't know where you are, 
then you're in good company. The towers, the turrets, the rooms leading off stairs, the unexpected dead ends. I think it took me nearly three years to find my way around this place. But it is a place that you've got to experience. And what is really wonderful is that you can step into the place through the paintings. So when I was a child, I went to the National Galleries and I remember so vividly wanting to step in and wander through the paintings and feel what it was like. It was probably what got me into art history at, the same, at that time, or later on rather. And the amazing thing is that I get to do this every time I visit Kelly. I get to walk into these paintings. It's a very rare thing and I really hope that you can come and experience it one day too because it's, it's definitely worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Antonia, for a really, really fascinating talk. Um, we, we've been sitting listening and thinking about the, the dates that family moved in and all of those details, lots to talk about. I know Margaret is going to take over now and um, chair the discussion. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you, Ellen Wendy, and thank you, Antonia, for an absolutely brilliant talk. Um, I was just thinking that every <coughs> single speaker has talked for the programme that we've done on different aspects of Kelly, but what everyone has successfully done is actually made us, the audience, sitting in our homes, actually feel like we're walking um, through Kelly Castle, and you did that incredibly and um, powerfully tonight. So thank you for that. And um, what amazing detective work, <laughs> really, and um, putting all these pieces together. So interesting. And obviously, you were very passionate about it. And that passion comes forward. And your passion and love of Kelly Castle is, is really clear as well. So thank you. I greatly enjoyed that. I think it was one of my favourites. So thank you. Um, so for questions, um, lots of people echo that, said it was absolutely um, wonderful. Um, Ian is asking if the story that the ceiling painting in the vine room was bought back at an auction. Is this true? Um, I'm not I, I'm not sure if it was an auction, but I know that the 14th Earl found it in Ireland and bought it for £100. Um, and I'm not sure if it was a roop, as in from a house sale um, or um, a regular public auction. Um, but it was it was taken. We know it was taken by the 11th Earl's wife to Ireland in 1830, and it was found in um, bought back in 1916. And they and some the 14th Earl paid 100 pounds for it. Thank you, Antonia. Um, now Tish asked um, as you were speaking. The, the story of Joanna Herbert. Um, she was asking how the family um, came to have Joanna as their nursemaid. But actually, before we can even answer that question, Callie has given an incredibly detailed um, response to that. So thank you very much, Callie, for that reply. Um, and certainly from what I am. Um, what I know and what other people have discussed in lectures, that's a really accurate reply. I don't know whether you just want to add anything else to that, Antonia? Yes, fantastic. So, um, Callie, I have actually read your little piece um, about the archive, so um, I'd like to be in touch with you, if possible, um, because I want to um, dig further into the story and, and bring more of the detail out. Um, Charlotte has kind of um, piqued my interest in this particular um, individual and to try and bring her voice out of the archive is something that I'm very keen on. So I have um, seen your uh, your description of, of the archive, which I, I really appreciated. Um, and that's absolutely correct. You know, she she was they, they met her um, and the first boy was born in 1880. Um, they were living there and they were um, introduced to um, all the right people and all the right servants kind of idea. Um, and so she came to work for them um, and travel backwards and forwards to them. And, and it's, it's quite fascinating to read um, Esther Chalmers's um, memoir, where she details um, her experiences with Joanna, with her nursemaid, um, and talks about how <clears throat> Joanna went back and she was very unhappy when she went back. Um, there's a small detail of why she was unhappy, but no, not, not a huge amount. 
but when they said would you like to come back she said yes uh, there's a boat in march i'd like to get on it so she came back to edinburgh um and and lived um didn't live with them but um she lived nearby and somebody has recently just sent me her death her death certificate which is really interesting and even more interesting is that her, on the same page um is hannah lorimer's death death notice as well so um the professor's wife hannah um and so it notes um that she dies um of uh, a softening of the um of the brain and a heart attack um and that joanna herbert dies of pneumonia um and that's 1916 is hannah's death and 1917 is joanna's death Thank you very much for that um, and, and great that you're kind of connecting to, to Cali as well. So hopefully that will um, that will reap rewards. Um, I think Carla is echoing what everybody um, thought. Marvellous presentation, great details, explanations, comparisons of paintings and photographs. Plus you spoke to us and didn't real adult, re didn't, sorry, read a dull script. And oh I'm good, excellent. I didn't I want to read a dull script. <laughs> I think that we would um, all echo that. So thank you. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people will be visiting Kelly Castle this um, season. So um, Carla is asking, are many of Lorimer's paintings still in Kelly Castle or, or is there a single large collection of his works in a particular gallery or museum? Kirkcaldy no, and the, I tell you what, this is what is so brilliant about the Lorimer Society's work on this exhibition. So if you want to see John Henry's paintings in a wanna, you must go to the exhibition because a large portion of them are in private collections. Um, there's a few overseas. So there's um, one in Australia and there's one in France. Um, there are, we have, um, Okay, I can't I can't remember, but I, I want to say about 16 items, um, John Henry items, including drawings and watercolours. Um, but some of the paintings that we have at the castle are on loan to us from private collections as well. So you can see them at Kelly, um, but we don't we don't necessarily own them. Um, we have a handful of paintings that we actually NTS actually own. Um, and then some other um, like City Art Centre has one and the Kokodi galleries um, have one there are a couple of it in England and Rochdale that kind of thing so they're spread all over the place plus there are some that we still haven't found so in this process of doing the exhibition we did actually find a number of paintings which was really exciting um potpourri for instance um a long time ago I'd been contacted by the donor family um, just didn't know what the painting was and really where it came from and just wanted more con context um, and um, then through another be bequest or another painting that came to Kelly we discovered a family had something that a painting that we've been looking for for a long long time um, that features in the exhibition and it's a marvelous painting it's not of Kelly but it's an interior um, so it's been really fabulous to find them all, but um, they are often hidden away in private houses. So this is the opportunity to go and see his work all in in one place. I feel I like I'm you're... selling. I should work for you guys. I'm selling the exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> I think in Krakodi have maybe got a few. I'm not sure exactly how many, but I think it's I think it's possibly more than one. And actually, Jane and um, Freel is coming to talk about Krakodi's collection in a couple of weeks' time and, and put that into the context of Scottish art as well. Right. So yeah. if you came here via Eventbrite and you're not aware that we've got other lectures on this subject, do check either our Edinburgh Museums and Galleries website or the Lorimer Society website because we've got all of the events listed um, on, on that and we're actually do, going to do um, a few in-gallery events as well. I, I can actually say that we're probably going to be able to do them now. We didn't think a couple of weeks ago that we were going to be able to, but things have changed so fast. Um, so please do check out our websites for all of the events. And if you're local to Edinburgh, try and get in for these last events. I have to say, it's really, really, I know this is a stupid thing to say, but it's really important to see them for real, you know, on the canvas. So one of the things I didn't know 
because they didn't look hard enough, but also because they didn't have a decent enough image. I did not see that um, Cupid in grandmother's birthday until I went to the exhibition and saw that painting for the first time face to face. And then I looked up and thought, oh my God, there's the Cupid. And I hadn't seen it before then. So I think for me, I mean, just knowing the paintings on paper for so long, um, it's really exciting to see them. Um, but you do miss huge amounts just seeing these things on the, you know, on a page or on the computer. So um, if it's possible, um, do try and see the originals. It's a silly thing to say because everybody knows that, but just thought I'd say it. Um, Ian is asking, Antonia, was the north window in the dining room, the one where the lower panels were painted by John Henry, originally full height or, or not the case? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so the panel paintings that are there are the ones that were created in 1879 to replace something that had been there. So I don't know if the Lorimers, I don't think they did, but I don't know if there was a full height with no window and then panels all the way up there. I also don't, because I don't really know what was behind there. One thing I've thought about doing, which I haven't done yet, is um, Violet Wild. Um, am I saying this right? No, I'm not. Um, Mary, Mary's brother, sorry, um, Hugh, Hugh's wife. Um, her brother was the one who did the changes, who changed the, um, added the kitchen into that space. So what I could do is try and find, um, if they still exist, um, his records and see um, what was changed. So what was there before? And that might give me a hint um, of what was kind of what it looked like before that. But even then, that's kind of the 1940s. It's not the 1870s. So uh, I'm not entirely sure if there was a panel painting where that window was uh, or not. It's, I don't know, is the short answer. Okay, thank you, Antonio. So um, I've got a question for you. Obviously your passion and love for um, Kelly comes over really strongly tonight, but do you have a favorite room and a favorite painting? Favorite room and a favorite painting? I have to say that the sunlight in the Scottish room is probably my favorite painting um that's the one that just glow it just glows it um and it's it's just really evocative of what kelly is like on the right you all know that we get beautiful summer sunny days in scotland and when you get one and it filters through those rooms it's just totally transportative takes you to another place so so that for me it captures the retreat and the quiet um and the beauty of the place and the softness of the place so that will have to be my favorite one for now um my favorite room well, that's a bit more difficult um probably the library because it feels really cozy and it's has that sort of historic plaster ceiling that was done in 1617 which is one of the oldest and it feels like a hug it <laughs> feels like this lovely hug of a room um it was originally built as a bedroom um it's a really human size very small um and it just still feels lovely and quirky and warm and a place that you could feel like you could sit and read a book really easily and are the doves that are so um, prevalent in so many of these lovely paintings, do they still live at Kelly? No, uh, it's mostly rooks. Um, so if you come to Kelly, one of the things that is really extraordinary is the sound. So when you walk up the walkway to the castle, um, there are lots of rooks in the trees. So they're the predominant bird now. I mean, there are owls and there are crows and there are various other things as well. But it's the rooks that are really dominant. And I was there um, just by chance several years ago when we had a, a solar eclipse. I don't know if you remember, I think was it was like five years ago or something. And the weirdest thing <laughs> happened. You only notice noise when it's not there. So when the solar eclipse happened, everything just sort of turned this tinge of green and the crows stopped making a noise. It was oh, wow. like everything stood still it was really bizarre and then as soon as the sun started leaching out again 
the birds started to kind of come back and so every time I'm there I think god these guys are loud <laughs> it's just, you know they you can hear them all the time thank you very much for that very personal um insight um I Alan Wendy's just noting as well that for those who may not know that the Lorimer Society holds an annual lecture at Kelly um, every year and that in future like us they'll probably look at a blend of kind of hybrid work and I'm certainly thinking for my own kind of programmes going forward from this 50-50 um, mm -hmm. in future so I know that someone from France is joining oh. us and said that um, you know felt completely part of Kelly tonight from from France and we've had international visitors attending um, all of our lectures which is just wonderful I think it's great that we're bringing everybody together um, in art and culture like this on a kind of cold miserable night in Scotland so um, <laughs> Thank you all. Um, if there's no more questions, um, I don't know whether either Antonia or Alan Wendy want to add anything before we, we wrap it up tonight. No, I'm very happy. We've had a lovely evening. Thank you very much, Antonia. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It's You're very welcome. It's a pleasure, always. Yeah, it's Thank a pleasure you, always. Thank you very much um, for everyone. And if people do have time and you do Twitter, we always appreciate a little feedback on our Twitter, which is at Edin Culture. And I've popped that into the chat. So do please, um, if you've got time, um, feedback to us. It helps us promote all of the other lectures as well. So thank you very much to everyone. And thank you especially to Antonia for an absolutely wonderful lecture. Thank you. <laughs>